Turn on my button there. There we go. <laughs> okay. But uh, Brother Rob will be back next Sunday, and uh, I think he'll be here for one week, and then uh, he heads to California for the, um, Mary, or for the uh, Shepherds Conference. Uh, he will be preaching at the Anchor Church, so I know he would appreciate your prayers while he's there. And uh, we'll be getting a report from that, I'm sure. And hopefully we'll get a report from the marriage treat, retreat to see how that went as well. We're going to be looking today uh, at the book of 2 Corinthians, as uh, Travis told you. Brother Rob had talked to me about a month ago about preaching uh, a couple of times. I'll be preaching again on the 10th. And uh, this passage came to my mind, and, and uh, I thought it tied in well with what I spoke about last time, which is hope. I spoke about really the foundation of hope. And so I gave Rob the passage I was going to speak from, and, uh, which is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and uh, he sent me back a message that says, uh, <laughs> he says, well, when I get there in a few months, I'll just skip that passage, you know. And so I said to him, well, you know, if it's a problem, I'll, I'll pick another passage because I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, step on anybody's toes. But, but anyway, just to let you know, you're going to be getting plenty of 2 Corinthians here. Probably, I think we spent a year in uh, 1 Corinthians. I don't know how long we'll spend in 2 Corinthians, but Rob will be speaking there. Uh, not next week, but I believe when he gets back from the marriage retreat, he's going to pick up in 2 Corinthians. So, uh, and, and also I want to thank Travis for reading that passage uh, in chapter 1, and, and I wanted him to read that. Rob asked me if I had a parallel passage, and so I picked that one out of chapter 1 because I think it relates to what I want to speak about in chapter 4. And really what I, what I want to speak on today has to do with perseverance and, uh, excuse me, I want to talk about the Apostle Paul a little bit before we get started, because he, he wrote this letter. Matter of fact, Paul wrote 13 of the books of the New Testament, and I don't know how much everybody knows about Paul, but I think this passage in chapter 1 really tells us something about him as a person. This is probably the most autobiographical letter of all of Paul's letters if you want to learn something about his life, this is the book to read. Because normally Paul is dealing with theology and dealing with issues in the church. He's dealing with false teaching, whatever it may be. But, but he very rarely speaks about his own life. And uh, there's a few letters where he does that. And this is the one where he tells us more about his trials and tribulations. And, and so if you want to learn something about his life, this is the book to go to. Uh, I don't know if you noticed when Travis was reading, but there is a passage in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians where Paul made the statement that he wearied, at times, he wearied even of life. And I, I remember the first time I read that. To me, it was kind of shocking because this is a, a spiritual giant, you know, that we all probably look up to because, uh, again, he wrote so much of the, the New Testament. He was a highly educated man, most likely a small, uh, not impressive looking individual. And he was highly criticized for that. And, and he tries to answer some of those criticisms in this letter. That's why he speaks so much of, of himself in 2 Corinthians. But uh, I want to look at a couple of passages before we get started, and if you don't mind doing a sword drill, I don't know if you all are familiar with sword drills, but when I was a kid, I grew up in, in church, and, and the kids would have sword drills like on Wednesday night, and we would all line up against the wall, and, and uh, they would call out a Bible verse, and you would try to find it, you know, and whoever found it first was the winner of the the that particular round, and, and you kept doing that. People got eliminated and so forth. And so we're going to do a little bit of that tonight, or this morning, so I apologize for that. But uh, I want to take you to a couple of passages before we get to the focal passage, just real quickly, and look at some things that tell us a little bit about the Apostle Paul and who he was and, and uh, why, really, God has chosen to use him and, and do this unbelievable work in his life. Uh, it's in uh, Philippians chapter 3. You may be familiar with this passage, but again, Paul is going to tell us a little bit about himself uh, in this particular passage. And he begins in verse 5 of chapter 3 to tell us some things about his life. He really is going to tell us 
his pedigree, something he was very proud of. As a, as a Jewish man, as a Jewish leader uh, in the community, he was very proud of these things, and he begins to list these things because he no longer is proud of them. God has changed his heart. God has shown him the futility of all these things. They just didn't mean anything. And uh, he was really working on what was a, a works-based salvation. You know, Paul was... Uh, a very zealous and a strict Jew and, and believed that he was earning God's favor by keeping the law and so forth. And I want you to listen to some of this as we read uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, just a couple of verses as he describes his life, okay? He begins in chapter or verse 5 and says this, he was circumcised on the eighth day. Now, what does that mean? Why is that important? Well, Paul is from a devout family. His family followed the law strictly, and, the, wall, and the, the, the law required a male child to be circumcised on the eighth day, specifically on the eighth day. And if you were from an Orthodox family who kept the law and was religiously zealous, then that's what would happen. And so Paul is listing that as part of his credentials. You know, he, he started life out right. His parents were godly people. And they saw to it that from a young age he followed the law. So he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was of the people of Israel. He was born an Israelite. He was born to God's chosen people. He was not a convert to Judaism. He was not a Gentile who became a Jew or anything like that. He was pure-blooded. And he goes on. He was of the tribe, uh, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Why is that significant? The tribe of Benjamin was the tribe out of the 12 tribes of Israel. It was the tribe that the first king of Israel came from. And what was the name of the first king of Israel? The name of the first king of Israel was Saul. And that's who the apostle Paul, his Hebrew name is Saul. That's most likely who he was named for. So again, that's a very, he's from a royal tribe a tribe that, that gave Israel its first king. It's also a tribe that when the nation split after the death of Solomon, I don't know how much of Israel's history you know, but after Solomon died, his son came to the throne and the nation of Israel basically erupted into civil war. And what happened was it split into two countries and it became the southern region from Jerusalem south became known as Israel, it stayed, or uh, excuse me, Judah, and there was only two tribes that remained loyal to God. And one was the tribe of Judah and the other was the tribe of Benjamin. All other ten tribes formed a separate nation, the northern kingdom, which kept the name of Israel. So Israel and Judah became two separate countries. And so Paul has a lot of pride in the fact that he's from one of the tribes that stayed loyal to God and loyal to, to David, the line of David. He goes on to say he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's a pure blood. This is what he's saying. There's no Gentiles mixed into his lineage. This is, again, something that he was very, very proud of as a Jew. There was no intermarriage with, with pagan cultures, any, anything like that in his family line. They were all Jewish and so forth. As far as the law, it says he was a Pharisee. What is a Pharisee? You know, we, we oftentimes, because of the New Testament, we look down when, on, on, on people that are called Pharisees. Pharisees was a religious sect uh, of Judaism, and it was probably the most strict of all the sects. There was the Sadducees, and so forth. we won't get into all of that, but the Pharisees were, were extremely strict, and they followed the law to, I mean, to an extreme and they did everything. They tied to everything. They, they tied their spices. They wouldn't travel on the Sabbath. And, and, and they just kept everything, the letter of the law, perfectly. And so Paul was a member of that sect of, Jude, of Jews, which there were only about 6,000 of the Pharisees that, that existed. And Paul was one of those, and he was very proud of that. He goes on to say, as to zeal. Now, zeal was this, being on fire for his faith. He, as for zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. So he went on to become someone who saw this new religion, this Christian religion, that saw it as a threat. 
and thought they were guilty of blasphemy. And so he, he tells us in the book of Galatians that he violently persecuted the church of God. And he, he, he attempted to destroy it. So this is who Paul was. He was a religious zealot, much like you would see a, a fundamentalist in the Middle East who would seek out and try to kill someone who is teaching something other than Islam. We see that a lot today. That's who Paul was. He was a religious zealot who, who took it so far that he went door to door seeing that Christians, people who practiced Christianity, faith in Christ, were followers of Christ, were arrested and, and, and put on trial and ultimately put to death. And so that was his life. He was a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, he was blameless. What does he mean? It doesn't mean he's sinless, but it means that he kept every law. I mean, you could not point to any inconsistencies in his life. You could not say that, Paul, you're breaking this law or you're not keeping that law. He was, he was zealous for it. And so he kept every law that there was, 613 oral laws that were added to the law of Moses. If you can imagine the uh, exhaustion it would take, you know, people looked up to Pharisees. I know today we look down on them because of the way Jesus condemned them and their, their religious practices. Uh, because it was, it was all about works. It wasn't about, there was no love for their fellow man. There was nothing like that in the uh, uh, practice of Judaism really altogether. And uh, so Jesus condemned their practices. And so we've kind of adopted that condemnation of the Pharisees. But in Paul's day, they were highly admired. These were religious men that, that you looked at with great, a great sense of awe. You know, these are men who sacrifice and, and keep the law to the nth degree. And so they were held in, in high regard. So we see Paul, that's who Paul was. And he was very proud of that. But when he came to Christ, he realized that that really, all of that stuff was of no value. And he goes on to talk about it here in this passage of Scripture. But whatever, I, whatever gain I had... From all of these things in his life, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Once he met Christ on the road to Damascus, he realized that his whole life had been a waste. He goes on to call it, literally, in the King James Version, they, they translate it dung. He calls his life a, a heap of dung. And it was just garbage and waste. And, uh, but I want to turn also to another passage. That's who Paul was. And then I want to see who Paul becomes and what God has a plan, God has a plan for his life. And uh, that's found in Acts chapter 9. I just want to look here again briefly. Starting in verse 10. This, if you're not familiar with the book of Acts, I mean, sit down and read it. It's an amazing read. It really is. And it, it's, I mean, there's a lot of exciting things that go on once, once it gets going. I mean, you see the perils and, and all the struggles that Paul faces along the way. Uh, you see some that Peter faced in the early part of the book of Acts, but, but then Paul kind of takes over. The focus becomes the Apostle Paul. You see his three missionary journeys. You, you see his stoning when he was stoned to death and le left for dead. You, you see him beaten in Philippi and put in jail. You, you see all of these things in the book of Acts. And you also see his conversion in Acts chapter 9. We see him first introduced in Acts chapter 7, the first mention of Saul, then his name was Saul, and, and his, God did not change his name. There's this misconception that somehow God changed his name. He didn't change his name. Paul is his Roman name, and Saul is his Hebrew name. And so as he begins to travel into the Gentile world, he's known by his Roman name, and he uses the name of Paul. So, you know, there's a switch that takes place in the book of Acts, and uh, it's not a, immediately after his conversion but Luke, who writes the book of Acts, starts calling him by the name of Paul as he begins his missionary journeys. But in Acts chapter 9, I'm not going to read the conversion of Saul, but he's on the road to Damascus. And he's, been, he's received letters from the high priest to go to the city of Damascus, which is north of Jerusalem, to travel there and to rest, to arrest anyone who is practicing what they call the way which is Christianity. They're followers of Christ. And, and so he has authority from the ruling 
council, the Sanhedrin, to arrest people and bring them back and put them on a trial. And, of course, they'll be executed for, for blasphemy. And so on the way, he, he has an encounter with the risen Christ, and, and this light appears, and Christ speaks to him and, and asks him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he doesn't know who it is, but, uh, you know, the Lord identifies himself and so forth. And, and then in verse 10, I want to pick up in verse 10 to see what happens in, in Paul's life. And uh, it says this, immediately following the, his encounter with Christ, it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on, on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. And so he, Ananias does not want to do what God is asking him to do, but listen to what God says. But the Lord said to him, go. Not going to take any excuses. Just go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For, and this is what I wanted you to catch. Verse 16, he says this. For I will show him how, he, how much he must suffer. For my name's sake. You know, there's this theology uh, that's part of the uh, American church. And it's the theology that says that uh, God is going to give you health and wealth and prosperity. He's going to make your life comfortable and pleasant and almost like a Santa Claus uh, kind of a, a God. And he's going to give you all your dreams and, and all of these things. The problem is, that's not the God we see in the Bible. This is the God we see in the Bible. And people often think, if, if my life is difficult, and if I have suffering, if I, if I go through trials and tribulations, then I'm under the, the attack of Satan, and, and that's definitely not from God. You know, that God has no part of that, because it's uncomfortable and unpleasant for myself. But I want us to see that the Bible doesn't teach that. It, matter of fact, it teaches the opposite of that. You know, it was God who, who offered his servant Job to Satan in Job chapter 1. Have you considered my servant Job? You know, he's above reproach. You know, he's faithful, above reproach. But listen, this God, God is saying to Ananias that I have chosen this man to carry the gospel to the Gentile world, to kings and to the children of Israel. And along the way, he's going to suffer greatly. So what does that mean? It means this. It means suffering in Paul's life, and, and I dare say suffering in our life, is part of the plan of God, and it has a purpose. And we're going to look at that today in the book of 2 Corinthians. So if you'd turn there with me. I'm going to ask you all to stand as we read this focal passage. I finally got there. So uh, we're going to read verses 7 through 18. And I just love the way this passage starts out. It's, uh, I know Paul had such a gift, and God used him in an amazing way. But his life was hard and difficult. But God carried him through. I want us to see, as we read this, how he was able to persevere. How was he able to get through the times of trial and tribulation when, when he, he told us that there were times in his life when he was in despair? I mean, when, when he wanted to quit, when he wanted to get up, when he was afflicted heavily, and he, he, there were times when he didn't even know what to do. You know, he wasn't this perfect, you know, stone-faced man. He had struggles like you and I do. And I want you to be encouraged from that as we read this passage. Starting in verse 7 of chapter 4. 
But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Christ's sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believe and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day, for this slight and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, For the things that are seen are transient or temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we thank you for the reality of what Paul is teaching us today. We thank you, Father, that uh, we have a treasure in this fragile jar of humanity. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us come to understand the power that resides in the life of the believer and how you sustain us, how you use it to get us through, how you use it to glorify your name. And I pray today, Father, you'll take the words of Scripture and illuminate our minds, help us to understand how you work in our life, and help us to see our lives differently, not always expecting ease and pleasure and and blessing in a material way. But help us to see with spiritual eyes what you're doing in our life to grow us and mature us and to transform us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And we just pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, everybody. I don't know if we're going to cover all of this today, um, but I want to hit... Verses 7 through 9 is one of the primary focuses I, I want to hit. And then verses 16 through 18, the, it's all so good. You know, it's one of the most powerful passages of Scripture uh, that I think Paul writes. And uh, it reminds us of the humility of his life. You know, even though he was highly educated and had a, had a lot of reason for pride in his life, God broke him of that. He was a very prideful man at one time, but God broke him of that, and God was able to humble him and to use him in such a powerful way in the lives of so many. He's still using him today. But what I want to talk about today as we work through this is perseverance. I want you to see how Paul perseveres through the trials and tribulations of his life, through the persecution. Now, now you may look at this and you may say, hey, I'm not going to face persecution like this in my life. And you may not. You may not face persecution like this. But, but the book of 1 Peter tells us when Paul, or excuse me, Peter is writing to persecuted believers that there are various kinds of trials that you will face in this life. So it may not be direct persecution. It may not be taken out and beaten and whipped or killed because of your faith. You may not face that, but you might. But what you will face is a trial of your faith, and I'll guarantee you that, you know, and it may be coming sooner than you realize, and how are you going to get through it? I talked previously about the importance of hope, and our hope being built on a theological foundation of truth. Well, I want us to see a more practical side of that hope as it works out in the Apostle Paul's life. He, has, he still has that, that same hope 
But I want us to see that it, there's also this surpassing power at work in his life. And it's not just, that power is not just for apostles and, and teachers and preachers and, and missionaries and people like that. That power is in your life too. The resurrection power of Christ lives in you. And Paul begins this passage of scripture with this great paradox of the Christian life. And he says it this way, but... We have this treasure in jars of clay. What in the world is Paul talking about? What's, well, number one, what's the treasure? Number two, what's the jars of clay? And, and what's the treasure that we possess? You know, when he speaks of jars of clay, obviously he's speaking as us, of us as human beings. Why does he use that terminology? Well, clays were made from dirt. I mean, pots were made from dirt. Jars were made from dirt, basically from clay. And the word actually means earthen vessel. And so it's a great analogy for a human life created from the dust of the ground. And what, what is, why does Paul use that analogy? Well, well, the clay pots, clay pots in the day of Christ and the day of Paul were really like the paper plates of our day. They were the disposable dishes that everyone used. I mean, when you, when you dig up an ancient city, literally they find thousands of these things. Some of them still intact, many of them broken in, in hundreds of pieces, and sometimes they're able to put them back together so we get a glimpse of what they looked like and so forth. But they were cheap, inexpensive, and common. And they were very, very fragile. They were easily broken. I remember as a kid, my, my grandma used to have clay pots that, and you can still buy them, that she put all of her, she was a, a uh, African violet nut, you know. I mean, she grew African violets like crazy. And she always put them in these orange clay pots. And I, I remember how easily they broke them because I broke several of them. Over there, got myself in trouble a few times, but, but they're, they're extremely fragile if you've ever been around one. And uh, so Paul uses this analogy, this, this illustration of a clay pot to describe his own life and describe our life. You know, that's what we are. We're common, we're ordinary. You know, we, there's this move in our culture to, to really, you know, yeah, to, for people to think really highly of themselves. And what I want us to see is, is in Christianity, it's different. It's not the vessel that's special. It's not the clay pot that's special. What's special is the treasure that's, that's hidden on the inside. And that's what gives you value. You know, it's that relationship with Christ. It's that indwelling power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. That's the treasure that's there. And it's oftentimes the treasure is hidden and you don't see it. And so what, what life is about is the process of breaking open the clay pot and revealing the treasure that's on the inside. And that's what God did in Paul's life. He was a common, ordinary vessel. You and I, were common, ordinary vessels. We're easily broken. Honestly, we can easily be replaced, just like a paper plate. You know, throw one away and pull another one off the shelf. They're inexpensive. They're easily replaced. They're disposable. It's not that you, I, I'm not saying you're not valued by God. You are valued by God. But you're really valued by God because of the treasure that he's deposited in your life. And that is the gift of, of the gospel. And, you know, we talk about the gospel a lot. And we talk about, you know, uh, being able to share the gospel. But the gospel isn't just a set of facts. You know, that's where we, we have to be careful. It's not just a, an agreement with a set of facts. It's an encounter with a living God is what it is. The gospel is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. And so Paul is talking to here about the treasure, and he starts this section with the word but. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. Why is that word but important? Because it tells us, you know, when you jump into the middle of a passage, it tells you that you need to look backwards, because what he's doing is he's contrasting. Paul's making a contrast with something. What is he contrasting with? Well, go back to verse 5 of chapter 4 and look what he says. For what we proclaim is not ourself, but Jesus Christ as Lord. Um, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light 
of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the treasure. The knowledge, the light, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The knowledge of God in the face, in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the treasure that Paul is comparing it to. And what is he comparing the treasure to? He's comparing this priceless treasure. That's the idea of the word. Something that's irreplaceable. Something that's rare, of extraordinary value, that's precious. Something that can't be replaced. That's what this treasure is. But he's comparing the treasure of, of Christ and the gospel message, the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. He's comparing all of that, really, to this one thing, and that's the jars of clay. It's the paradox of the Christian life. Why would God put such a priceless treasure in such a worthless, common, ordinary clay pot? Why would he do that? Well, he tells us here. He tells us why God is doing that. So I want you to see your life this way. You're, you're common, you're ordinary, but at the same time, you, you are the vessel for a priceless treasure that God has deposited in your life. If by faith you've given your life to Christ, if you, if you have turned to him as your only way of salvation, if you've renounced yourself and, and renounced the fact that, that you can do nothing to earn God's favor, that I'm wholly dependent on the grace and mercy of an almighty God who has offered his son as a propitiation and a sacrifice for my sins. If you've done that, then you have this treasure. God gives it to those by faith, those who believe in his son. You have this treasure. But he goes on in verse 7, and I want us to see this is the source, number one point I want to make. This is the source of the strength in the believer's life. This is the key to Paul's persevering through all these times in his life when he was weary even of life, when he didn't care if he woke up the next morning. He even talks, there's times when he talks about how he would rather go and be with the Lord, but he knows it's better if he stays here. It's better for the church. It's better for the body of believers so that he can teach and instruct and, and so forth. But this is the source of his strength. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that, this is the purpose clause, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. All well, right, there's your answer. Why do you go through difficult things in this life? Why do you go through things that aren't the consequence of your sinful choices? First, let's kind of clarify that. Uh, sometimes you go through, through difficult times because you made sinful choices. But what Paul is talking about is those things that come upon us from an outside source and weren't generated by our own sin. Notice what it says, to show that they're surpassing power. The power in your life, your ability to endure. As we look at this next section of Scripture, we're going to see that somehow through all of this pain and suffering and torment, Paul did not give up and did not quit. I know in my own life there's been those times when I felt like that. And I know I'm looking at the faces of people that have been through difficult times because we all have those. And I know there's times that when there's been so much coming at you. It may be because of your faith in Christ. It may not be. It may be an illness, it may be you know, financial trouble, it may be many, many things. Maybe the loss of a job that puts you in financial trouble, whatever it may be. It may be the death of a child. Maybe the loss of a, of a child, you know. I mean, there's all these things that we face. There's various trials, Peter tells us, that the believer will face. And every one of them is a test of your faith. Will I trust God in the midst? And why does God put us through those things? Number one, this, this life is temporary. You know, the Bible tells us it's a vapor. It's like the dew in the morning. It comes and, and as soon as the sun comes up, it's gone. That's the way, you know, James compares our life to that. You know, it doesn't last long. And so what God is doing, he's, he's showing that your ability to endure and your ability to make it through the difficult things in this life is because of the power of God at work in you. That the surpassing power, 
The power that goes beyond, the word surpassing, is the idea of throwing beyond, to throw beyond. Like, like if I'm, I'm trying to throw the ball here to Travis and I throw it way in the back, that's surpassing. That's the idea here. So the power goes way beyond what I need. I mean, it, it's surpassing, it's, it's excessive, it's abundant. You know, that's the kind of power that exists in the life of a believer. All we have to learn to do is to move forward in faith and to trust God along the way. It is there. It is there. You don't have to do anything special to activate it. God will sustain you, you know, no matter what it is that you're going through. And believe me, I mean, I've experienced this in my own life. I've experienced those times where I felt, I, I felt crushed and I didn't want to go on. And I thought, why in the world has God done this? You know, and there was times when I was even angry and, and said things. And then, you know, it's, a, it's amazing sometimes I can remember saying some things that my frustration with God. And, you know, there's a little bit of that prosperity gospel in all of us, you know, where we expect God to, to treat us a certain way because we're his child and, and uh, we expect to have favorable treatment and life to go good. And when it doesn't, you know, and, and you, you try to tell God all the things that you've done, and, and you know, it, it, uh, it's a desperate cry, and, and man, God lovingly understands and, and, and listens and puts up with us through all those trials and, and things, and then what happened, what happened to me was I remember, <laughs> I remembered a verse from the book of Job that came to my mind, you know, when I was in one of these, these moods, and, and, uh, and it said this about Job. You know, he lost everything. Job lost everything. In one day, he lost everything. Everything he owned, everyone he loved, except for his wife, he lost everything. And it says this in the book of Job, that in all that he suffered, Job never accused God of doing wrong. Wow. Wow. You know, that, that's faith, folks. Never accused God of doing wrong. How many times have we accused God of doing wrong? You know, that, that, that's sin, you know, is what it is. And God, but God is growing us. He's changing us. He's, he's maturing us. But I just want you to see the strength to endure in Paul's life came from the surpassing power of Christ, the, the message of the gospel, the person of the gospel, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit living in him enabled him. Now listen to what he says in the next verses. I want us to see the suffering that he takes him through. And there's a purpose in it. We're going to see that there's a purpose in it. You know, we have to begin to look at our life differently. When difficulties happen, what, what is God doing? What does God, how does he want me to respond in this difficulty? Well, I'll tell you one way he wants you to respond in every difficulty he wants you to respond with faith. He wants you to stay committed. He doesn't want you to give up and to throw in the towel and to say, where is this God, you know, who supposedly loves me? I'll tell you why, where he is. He's right there in the middle of everything that's going on in your life, directing things for your good. You know, that we quote that passage from, from Romans chapter 8 all the time. You know, all things work together for good. Remember that? All things work together for good. For those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. But we forget the all things part of it, you know. We, we just think God's working things for good in my life. Well, he's working all things. That means the crummy stuff, the crummy stuff, the difficult stuff. That stuff he's using. But look at this next section of scripture, uh, verses 8 through 9. We, were, we, we are afflicted. Notice it's present tense. This isn't something in Paul's past as he writes this letter you know, four of his letters are written from prison. The book of Philippians is written from prison. The book of Colossians is written from prison. Philemon is written from prison. You know, but yet he has joy in those letters. He has love in those letters. How can he do that? Well, listen to what he says in this passage. We are afflicted in every way. I want you to see that these are, these are given to us in what, what's called a couplet. You know, there's two things being contrasted here. You've got the work, what's going on in his flesh contrast with what this surpassing power is doing in his life. I want you to see that because that's important. Notice, I want you to see how God's working. It's not this miraculous delivery 
like God parted the Red Sea and, and got Paul through it. I want you to see how God is working. It's in small ways, but it's in significant ways, okay? We always want the sea to part, but sometimes what God is doing is he's simply sustaining you, giving you strength and power to endure because that endurance builds steadfastness. You know, it builds commitment. It builds perseverance. It builds, you know, character. It builds trust and faith in, in Almighty God. Listen to what he says. We are afflicted. It's the idea of being squeezed and, and put under extreme pressure. We're, we're being squeezed in every way possible, Paul says. As I, as I commit my life to Christ, as I travel, as I share the gospel, as I preach on his behalf, as I minister to the churches, it's like I'm being squeezed by everything in my life. And these are genuine hardships that he's facing. I, I want to read a passage of scripture to you. And I, you're probably familiar with it, but in case you're not, I'm going to read it anyway. <laughs> but it's found in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, begins in verse 24. I want you to listen to this. I'm going to read it kind of slowly because it's a lot to take in. And this is Paul once again telling us about his life. And, you know, he did not, I don't know where the prosperity gospels preachers get, get their doctrine from. It's certainly not from the word of God. Because I don't know a more godly man um, than the apostle Paul, but yet he suffered greatly. Listen to how he describes his life starting in verse 24 of chapter 11, 2 Corinthians. He says this, five times, five, I want you to count it, five times. I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes minus one, okay? He was whipped with a, with a, with a, a, a I think it's called a phlegrum, which is a tool that, well, it's what Christ was whipped with, whipped with. And it has leather thongs with bits of bone and balls of steel on them. And they tear your skin and they, and they bruise your muscle tissue and all of these things. Well, the Jews would only, the Jewish law would only allow 40 lashes because anything over that would certainly kill the individual. And Paul was given, and so the custom became to be given 39 lashes instead. That way, in case you miscounted or something, you weren't breaking the Mosaic law and so forth. And, and so here we see that five times he received the 39 lashes. Five times, three times, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned in the city of, uh, it's either Lystra or Iconium. Uh, he was stoned to death and drug outside the city and left for dead. Uh, of course, he didn't die. Uh, there was, if you read chapter 12, you find out that Paul has this out-of-body experience and actually goes to heaven. And, uh, but God will not allow him to speak of the incident, and he tells us about it in chapter 12. And many people think it was when he was stoned and drug out of the city and left for dead that that happened. But he was, um, uh, see if I, he was stoned three times. I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I was adrift at, the sea, uh, at sea. On frequent journeys, he was traveling all the time. And scripture doesn't record most of this stuff. He was in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles. Paul's life was constantly, there was constantly plots to kill him and to, to close his mouth and to shut up the cause for Christ. He was in danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure, you know, that it's that affliction of my anxiety for all the churches. I mean, that's what he went through. And somehow, through it all, he came out the other side, and he closes his life with that famous statement, I've fought the good fight. And I've finished the course. And I've kept the faith. You know, never did he give up. Even though at times his flesh, you know, he wanted to, the spirit working in him would not let him do that. It carried him through. And why am I talking about this? 
Because that same spirit lives in you. And in the trials and tribulations of your life, when you feel like giving up, the Holy Spirit is not going to let you do that. He is going to carry you through. And he is going to supply this surpassing power in your life. That's what he does. He enables us. In Philippians chapter 2, thir- uh, chapter 2 verse 13, it says that it's God who's working in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. It's God working in Paul. It's God working in you. He's the one. He's the one that will get you through whatever difficulty, whatever trial, whatever time of of rejoicing you have. He will protect you during those times. But listen what else he goes on to say. We were perplexed. It's the idea that he was at a total loss. He was perplexed. He didn't know what to do, where to go, how to turn. I mean, he was, he was pressured on every side, and he was like a mouse in a trap at times. And he had no idea what to do. I don't know about you, but it does me good to know that I'm not the only one that's ever felt like that. This, this giant of a man of faith also felt like that in his life, like he, he didn't know what to do. He didn't know where to turn. He didn't know what, there were times when, Possibly he didn't even know what God wanted him to do. If you remember his uh, journey, uh, I think it was the second missionary journey, where he everywhere he tries to turn, he says, the Holy Spirit stops me and will not let me go. And then he has this Macedonian call where he goes to Macedonia and takes the gospel to the European continent, you know, where Lydia gives her life to Christ in the city of Philippi, outside the city of Philippi at the river. And it's an it's an amazing thing that God is doing in his life, but he was afflicted at a loss, but it says that he was not driven to despair. You know, he never reached that point in his life because of his mental confusion or his uncertainty about why he never just gave up and went home. You know, I think that was why Paul was so upset with John Mark. If you remember the story of John Mark on the second Or on the first missionary journey, John Mark went with with Paul and uh, Barnabas on the uh, first missionary journey. And somewhere along the way, the city in Antioch or somewhere, he turned back and went back home. And so when it came time for a second missionary journey, again, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark. And Paul says, no way. He's not going. You know, he's a quitter. You know, he, he left us. And, you know, stranded us out there in the middle of nowhere. You know, these guys traveled hundreds and hundreds of miles on foot or horseback. However, they traveled over mountains and rivers and valleys, over seas. They, they often would get in a ship and cross one of the seas there and, and so forth. So, I mean, it was, it was difficult. What they did was difficult. But they never reached the point of giving up. He goes on to say this. They were persecuted. Persecution, it's the idea they were hunted down like dogs, you know, like animals. They were constantly being hunted by people. But they were never, what does he say? But they were not forsaken. They were never abandoned by God in their time of greatest need. That's what the idea of forsaken is when you leave someone who is in desperate need and you have the ability to help, but you turn your back and you walk away. Now, Paul knows what that's like. When Paul is in prison at the end of his life, you know, this is amazing. It's an amazing ending, and and you can read about it in the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy. What happens to Paul is he's arrested a second time and and he's in prison in Rome and he's, he's in the the Mamertine prison in Rome. And if you've ever read anything about it, it it still exists. You can still see the cell where Paul was in prison in the city of Rome. And, uh, but the only way, the cell where they, where they hold the prisoners, you, you have to be let down through a hole in the ceiling. And the conditions there are deplorable. I mean, they're just terrible. It's cold. It's damp. There's a, like a little bit of a creek thing that runs through there. So it's, it's freezing cold. And Paul is there awaiting trial, knowing, knowing that he is going to be executed. He's already had his preliminary hearing, and he's waiting for his, his final uh, his sentencing, which he knows is going to mean he has to lay down his life. And he makes this statement. He says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, 
everyone has deserted me. So Paul knows what it's like to be forsaken. As he's in prison about to die, he says, everyone has forsaken me. All those traveling companions, all those people that came and you know, we're, we're trying to minister to him at one time. They've all forsaken them. They, want, they don't want to be associated with Paul because they're going to be arrested and their lives will be taken also. So they've abandoned Paul. And he said, the only one with me is Luke. And so he's writing this letter to Timothy saying, uh, you know, come, come for a, kind of a last visit, his son in the faith. Come and visit me. Come quickly. You know, bring my coat. It's cold here. You really see his humanity in this passage as he is about to be executed. And, uh, but he says this, he makes this bold statement. And to me, it's, very, it's a very moving scene. And he says, uh, everyone has abandoned me. But he said, but the Lord stood by me and gave me strength. You know, in his moments of greatest need, God was there, you know. And man, you read the stories of martyrs, if you've ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs or anything like that, it's a hard read. I'm not necessarily suggesting that for everybody, but there are books like that you can read. But it's amazing how the grace of God pours out at that time of need in people's lives when they're being burned at the stake. Or I mean, I'm not, just, I'm not some gruesome person that likes to read that kind of stuff, but uh, man, it's miraculous what God does to people in those times, how he carries them through in their time of need and how they have this peace and serenity. And, and Paul is saying, that's what's happened in my life. You know, uh, I was never forsaken. I was struck down. You know, it means knocked to the ground. You know, it's kind of an athletic analogy where he's saying, I was knocked down, but I wasn't knocked out. Notice that, again, that first word is what's happening in his flesh because of his service to the Lord. The second word is what God is doing through this surpassing power in his life. I was struck down, but I was not destroyed. God made sure of that, you know, and he carried, he carried me through. And I want to hop on down. Well, let me just read through this next section. I don't want to skip it, because, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. It's pretty hairy. It has a, a, I'll let Rob explain it more when he goes through it. But really, verses... 10 and 11 are an explanation of verses 8 and 9. He's explaining really what God is doing. This is what God's doing. And he says this in verse 10, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. You know, every day Paul faced death. And uh, so that, this is the reason, so that the life of Jesus, this is why God did this in his life. So that the life of Jesus may be manifested or made known. Manifested is the idea of something that's unseen being revealed or made known or seen clearly. And so why is God doing this? Why is he making Paul suffer? Because he wants, let me read it again, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. He wants people to see Christ in him. As Paul endures things that are beyond his physical limitations, beyond his mental limitations, as he endures and survives and thrives, man, God is the one who gets the glory for it. And I'm telling you, the same thing is true in your life, same thing true in my life. If, if you have a difficulty coming, cry out to God. If you're in the middle of one, he will sustain you and get you through because what does it do? It shows the people around you. People are watching People are watching how you deal with, with difficulties in your life. Just like in the story from the book of Exodus, people were watching Moses as he went out and, and as the pillar of cloud came down and, and Moses had this face-to-face -face communion with God, that passage says. People were watching. And what happened? What happened in that passage? The worship that was taking place, the, the intimacy between God and Moses led the people at the entrance of their own tent to bow and worship. That's what God wants in your life. He wants when you're in the middle of a struggle, he wants that struggle and the way you respond to cause others to bow and worship, to ca cause others to say, I want what they've got because I don't have that kind of peace. I saw this the other day on the internet and it was, to me, this was really striking and this is kind of an example of what I'm talking about. 
there was a sentencing that was on uh, YouTube the other day, and it was, uh, somehow I came across it, but there was this uh, sentencing that was taking place of a mass murderer. He had killed several uh, girls, women, young women. And uh, all these people were coming up at the sentencing and speaking. And every one of them was saying, you know, I hope you rot in hell and, and all of this stuff. I was saying really all this evil stuff. And I understand that, believe me. I understand that emotion and, and so forth. I'm not necessarily condemning that at all. But then there was this man who came up and he said, uh, my faith won't allow me to hate you, you know. And he said, so I want you to know I've forgiven you, you know. I still want you punished, you know, for what you did, but I've forgiven you. And the guy who was the uh, murderer took his glasses off and just broke down, you know, and started to cry, you know. And it was just such an unexpected response, you know. I mean, this, this guy, you could tell he understood why, why people were so angry with him. But then he, what he didn't understand was someone who could offer him forgiveness. And he just say, he said this, I want you to know you're forgiven. Wow. Wow. That, that's an amazing thing. You know, it reminds me of the parable of the unforgiving debtor. You know, so often we have been forgiven a debt that's so unbelievable and yet we hold the slightest infractions over the heads of other people, you know. But, you know, I thought that was a good example. But listen, the idea is so that Jesus Christ will be made known in your life, that people can see Jesus at work in your life. They can see who he really is. They can see God clearly. Then he goes on in verse 11 to include you and I in it, for we who live... You and I, we're, we're always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so he'll be glorified, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal, mortal flesh. So it's not just, this doesn't just happen to Paul, this happens to you, this happens to me, this is what God is doing. So Paul says, so death is at work in us, you know, he's talking about the, 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 the threat of death and, and so forth and the way that he's responding to it. So the way he's responding to it will be a benefit to them. So they will see and others will see the difference Jesus Christ can make in the life of someone who lives by faith. But he goes on to say this, and, and I'm just going to buzz through this so we can get to the last. According to what was written, I believe and I speak. So Paul is, is throwing out a verse from the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, and he says this, we also believe and we also speak. So I, I just want you to see quickly, Paul is convicted that he believes what the word of God says. And so what he's saying is uh, what, he, what God has, uh, how do I want to say that? You know, Paul is convicted in, of the, the promises of God here, and that God will do everything that he says he will do. And uh, listen to what he says in verse 14. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus. He believes that God will do that and will bring us into his presence. So well, part of what motivates God, what motivates Paul, and what should motivate us are these promises of God. God has promised that uh, those who live by faith, those who give their life to Christ, will one day be resurrected and will spend eternity in the very presence of God himself. It is... It is all for your sake so that the grace extends to more and more. So I want you to see this also. What's going on in, in your life is that God is allowing you to go through these things so other people will have the opportunity to experience the same grace that you had. I think the passage Travis read this morning kind of illuminates that. And, you know, the suffering that we go through sometimes is, is what God uses us to be able to minister to others. If you've gone through the loss of a loved one, you know, you're going to be much more apt to be able to minister well to someone who's gone through that. Sometimes that's what God is doing in your life. So grace will extend. It might be that very outreaching to that person. It might be the outreach to that person that God uses to bring them to faith in Christ. And so that's what God is doing here. I want to move on down quickly uh, into verse 16 and, and because this is kind of the heart of what he has to say. 
Uh, you know, we have this surpassing power that gets us through all the difficulties of this life. But in verse 16, he says this, so we do not lose heart. And again, so is a word that kind of refers back. Because I believe in what God says, because I believe in his word, because I believe in his promises, because I believe in the resurrection, he's saying this, I do not lose heart. You know, because of the presence of Christ in my life, because of the surpassing power, we do not lose heart. We do not reach this point of total discouragement where we just throw in the towel and walk away. You know, we see that all the time. We see these so-called believers who go through suffering in their life and they walk away from their faith. There's a big thing going on now called uh, deconstructing your your Christianity or deconstructing your faith, where people are, are basically, you know, just to summarize it up, they're just walking away from their faith. They don't believe anymore, you know, and, and most of it is when you, when you hear the interviews, most of it is because of suffering. They don't understand how a God of love can allow you to suffer. And this is where biblical illiteracy has really compromised the church. Because we, we have a different expectation of God than the one in Scripture. And so what happens is we've created a God of our own fashion. You know, we've, we've created an idol. God is no longer the God of the Bible. He's the God that I think. You know, this, I don't think God would do that. You know, I had this conversation a couple of weeks ago with a friend. And he told me, well, I don't think God would do that. Uh, you know, I said, it doesn't matter what you think. You know, <laughs> what matters is what the Bible says. You know, but, but we've made it all subjective. And I'm going to believe this and not believe that. I'm going to believe this part of the Bible and not believe that part of the Bible. You can't do that. You come up with a religion of your own making. You come up with a God who's not the God of the Bible. And, you know, Paul believes what the Bible says. He believes in the promise of the resurrection. So he doesn't lose heart. You know, he, he has faith. He knows that this life is not all there is. He knows there's more to come. So he hangs on, and he relies on God, and God sustains him through it all. So we do not lose heart, though our, notice what it says, though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. There's something going on in the life of a believer. Though the outer man is wasting away or decaying is the idea. There's this process of decaying or dying, literally dying, in the life of a believer. There's two kinds of dying. There's a physical dying. You know, there's the, the wasting away of the body, while at the same time, the inner man is being renewed by this surpassing power that dwells in the life of the believer, the Holy Spirit. He's renewing you day by day. He renews you through the Word of God. As you feed on the Word of God, He's renewing you, and He's making you new every day. You're changing. If you can't look at your life and see a change that's taken place, if you can't see how God has changed your priorities, if you can't see how God has changed your character, if you can't see how God has changed the depth of your love for, for uh, people in your life, if you can't see how God has given you a love for his word and a love for his people, if you can't see that, then you need to really question whether or not you truly are a follower of Jesus Christ because he will change your life and he will renew you day by day. He will renew you. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, tells us he's renewing our mind. The way we think is changing. I think differently than I thought 20 years ago. I think differently than I thought 10 years ago. And that's not because of me. That's because of the Word of God working with the Holy Spirit in my life. It's changing my mindset. It's changing my focus. Listen to what he says here. For this slight and momentary affliction, all that you're going through Paul is not making light of it. He uses the word affliction, so that means he understands it's real, it's difficult, but he wants you to see it's only momentary and it's light. When compared to, to what God has planned for you, and what God will one day give you, this is going to seem like nothing, is what he's saying. It's light, when in fact it may be the heaviest thing you're going through in this life. You know, I know when I lost my wife, I thought, you know, I've never, I've never hurt like that. To be honest with you, I never cried like that, you know. And I thought, you know, there, it, it can't get any worse, you know. And then Paul tells me this, that it's light. And it's momentary. It is. 
In reality, when, when you compare it with eternity, it's only a moment. It's the twinkling of an eye. You know, and, and it'll be over, and I'll be there, and you'll be there. We'll all be there with Christ. We'll actually one day be here again, you know, ultimately is where we'll be. But it's going to seem like nothing in comparison. The glory is so far, so far outweighs the suffering and affliction that it's like nothing is what he's saying. And, it, and, it, and it's doing something in your life. Notice what he says, verse 17, this, this slight and momentary affliction is doing something. It's preparing something in your life. There's a work going on. The suffering is, isn't just arbitrary. It's just not random. It's planned by God. It's controlled by God. God is sovereign over everything. And it's accomplishing something in your life. Okay? And look what it's accomplishing in your life. It's accomplishing an eternal weight of glory. This eternal weight of glory, something that you can't even measure. It's the idea of, you know, the weight, heaviness. I want you to see the contrast here. You know, uh, light and heavy. You know, the affliction is light. The glory is heavy. Um, let's see the other one. Um, There's, a, there's more in there. I'm missing them. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Wow. I mean, there's nothing in this life that even compares to what God has planned for you. And the glory that you will one day inherit in the kingdom of God for all eternity. And so many times we are tempted to lose heart and to give up along the way. But that's not what a believer does. He learns to rely on the sustaining power and strength of Jesus Christ in his life. He says this, as, how do you do that? How do you rely on that power? Notice what he says in verse 18. As we look not to the things that are seen. Here's our problem. We see all these things that are, are overtaking us and overwhelming us, and I'm sure Paul did that too all these trials and tribulations that are overtaking us. We see the, the bill maybe that we can't pay. We, we see, you know, the struggle in the lives of our kids, and it's overwhelming. They, they've, they've gotten mixed up in drugs or alcohol, or they've gotten uh, a teenage pregnancy or something like that, and it's overwhelming, you know. And all we're doing is looking at what we can see. You know, we don't, we're not focusing on what God is doing. What can God do with this mess you know, how is, he gonna, how is he gonna work in my life? How is he gonna turn this thing around? Am I gonna trust him in the middle of that? Or I'm gonna give up and say, God, I've served you all these years and you let this happen and just walk away. Because people do that all the time, folks. They do that all the time. But this light and momentary affliction is working for us a glory that is beyond comparison, so don't give up. The glory far outweighs the affliction. As we look not to the things that are seen, so what he, here's what he's saying uh, he wants us to do. He doesn't want us to focus only on what's seen. He wants us to focus on the things that are unseen. Now, how do you do that? How do you see something? How do you focus on something? How do we look at something we cannot see? <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a weird concept. How do we do that? There's only one way, really, that, or maybe two ways that I know to do it. Number one is you look, you see through the Word, the Word of God. That's where you see God. It's where, you know, we see the unseen here. You know, we see who God is. That's what we're doing today. We're seeing who God is. God is the sustaining power that works in our life. That's who He is. We're seeing that through this Scripture today. So that's one way you can see the thing that is unseen. So don't focus on the temporal, the things that you can see, because they're going to pass away one day. Well, one day this trouble that seems overwhelming, you know, Paul wearying even of life as he tries to take the gospel, you know, one day that was all gone for him. That weight was gone and, and he lifted his eyes and he was in the presence of Jesus Christ, you know, and, and it was all over. It was temporary. And so for us, we need to begin to focus on the things that we can't see. I'll tell you another thing. Another way you can see the unseen. 
is in the lives of God's people, you know, as they live by faith. You know, read through chapter 11 of the book of uh, Hebrews and, and, and see. You can see the unseen there. You can see how men in, in that passage of Scripture lived by faith and did things by faith in something they, they hadn't seen. I remember uh, a passage from the book of uh, 1 Peter. I've been using that as a reference a lot today. But in 1 Peter, there's a, there's a phrase that he uses when he's addressing the church, this church that's being persecuted. And he says, uh, he's speaking of Jesus, and he says, whom you have not seen, yet you love. And Peter, I think, he uses it twice in that passage. And I think he's just amazed by the reality that, you know, I walked with Jesus. I, I saw him. I know he's real. And I, I had this great privilege and advantage. These people, they never saw him. They don't know anything uh, about what he looked like or they never saw the things that he did. All they have is the written record. But yet they believe. And man, that's an amazing thing. And they believe because of the word of God and they believe because of the life of believers, the testimony of believers, the testimony of the word and the testimony of believers. You know, faith comes by hearing, Scripture says, and hearing by the word of Christ. But he says this, and we'll close up. For the things that are seen are transient or they're passing away. Do you realize that? Do you ever think about life that way? Look around. Everything you see in here today besides the people that are here, this one day it will all be gone. You know, I'm, I'm in a business where I see the earth working to reclaim itself. You know, you, if you neglect your home, it won't be long. <laughs> won't be long before it starts to fall apart and, and the elements begin to reclaim it and turn it back to dirt and dust and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, if you don't keep up, that's, that's just the nature of things. But uh, all this stuff is passing away, except for the people that are here. And that's the only thing that is eternal that's in this room today. And uh, so he says this, for the things that are seen are transient, or they're passing away, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So what is he saying to us? You've got to focus on what's eternal. In the midst of your trials and your tribulations and your struggles, you can't focus on the struggle. It doesn't mean to ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. You have to deal with it. But, but what you have to do is turn to the unseen for your strength. You can't see the surpassing power that's in you, but you can see the result of it. You know, in a couple of weeks, we're going to look at a passage where, where Jesus uses the wind as an example. You know, you can't see it, but you can see the effect of it, you know. And same is true with the Spirit. You know, he uses that analogy to describe the work of the Spirit, the sovereign work of God in the life of a believer in salvation. You know, he uses that illustration of wind to do that. But for us, you know, as we look at this passage of Scripture, as we go through the difficulties of our life, I hope maybe some of these things will come to your mind as you, as you try to make application to it. Number one, I said, uh, you know, t I titled this message, and I, I figured you were reading it back there, so I didn't say it, but Christ in us, that's the surpassing power, is Christ in us. He gives us the strength, you know, to get through. He sustains us in our times of adversity and our times of struggle. He convicts us. He brings conviction Conviction that holds on to the truth, that holds on to all the promises of God. Everything that he's promised in his word, you know, we, we hold on to that. And then he is the one. He is the one who's working in us to give us this new focus, to help us to see, you know, that this is not all there is, folks. I mean, I know we know that. But, you know, we, we go through our day-to-day our -day life and, and we very seldom think about it. We let the pressures, the afflictions, all the things of this life, we let those pressures take our mind off of what truly matters and take our mind away from all the supply of strength and grace that we have in the person of Jesus Christ, you know, in the form of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Man, he has given us much more. He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. First Peter or Second Peter 
one, three, I forget where that lo that's located. But he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. He will not. Paul was never forsaken. Whatever, wherever you find yourself today, you know, if you find yourself in a trial, you know, man, pull out the word of God. You know, he will feed you and sustain you from that. Get on your knees and pray. Call on a brother or sister in Christ. Those are the way we can see what is unseen. And we can see that through the faith of others, through the lives of others, it will help us through those difficulties in this life. I couldn't have made it. I honestly couldn't have made it if it wasn't for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I wouldn't have made it, you know. Because there's times in this life when, when you do weary even of life like the Apostle Paul did. Take courage, take encouragement from that. You know, that even this great man of God had moments in his life when he was discouraged. And when you get discouraged, do what he did. You know, rely on that strength. And that comes, like I said, through the Word of God, through the children of God, and through prayer. You know, I mean, those are the best ways. But anyway, we're going to wrap up and have a word of prayer. And then... Uh, uh, Alex is going to come. We'll sing a few more songs. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that when you saved us, Lord, you didn't just leave us, but you gave us the Holy Spirit. You gave us this immense treasure, Father, housed in jars of clay. And we know that throughout the, the years of our life that that jar will be cracked and broken and Hopefully, Lord, what's inside will be revealed and we will shine forth with the love of Christ and the character of Christ in our life. So I just pray, Father, that you would do the work that you need to do to glorify your Son, to glorify you. Father, just help us to have the maturity to trust and depend on you along the way so that other people might see the reality of Christ at work in us, and you may receive, as that passage says, you know, glory and praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.